بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so last week we had discussed the um, initial victory of the Muslims uh, and uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala references this in the Quran and by the way inshallah uh, maybe not next Wednesday but two Wednesdays from now we will go over the verses about surat uh, uh, in surah Ali Imran about Uhud just as we went over uh, surah Al Anfal about Badr we're going to go over all the verses about Uhud uh, and Allah subhanahu wa taala uh, in these verses Allah subhanahu wa taala says walaqad walaqad wa'adakum Allah walaqad subhanallah Allah subhanahu wa taala fulfilled his promise uh, on you subhanallah I can't remember the verse right now surah al imran hafizab walaqad nasarakum Allah no that's not it no, 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 we're talking about Badr, we're talking about Uhud now. We did Badr many months ago. Uh, in any case, it'll come to me. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised them that as I promised you, I helped you. Right? Uh, that as I promised you, uh, I helped you. Uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal had promised them. This is the verse. Then when you yourselves lost your himma, you, you kind of became lazy. And you began arguing amongst yourselves. And you saw that which you loved. So Allah says, when you were pure and sincere to me, I gave you what I had promised you. But when you yourselves faltered, and you yourselves fell back, and you yourselves became greedy for something, then Allah says, uh, uh, this is when the disaster basically uh, struck. And in the books of Sirah, we learn uh, the details of what happened. And as I said, one of the problems of Uhud, and this is what we're going to face all of today and a little bit of next Wednesday, uh, one of the problems of piecing together Uhud is that we don't have a detailed picture. All we have is one story of Mus'ab, one story of Hamza, one story of this, one story of that. And then we don't have a generic picture of the battle. And therefore, reconstructing Uhud, in my humble experience with the seerah, is the most difficult task of the whole seerah. In my humble experience with the seerah, trying to understand exactly what happened in Uhud, because Uhud is one of the most decisive battles, and it was somewhat of a disaster, and it was very chaotic. So to this day, in my humble opinion, there's a lot of questions about Uhud that maybe we'll never know. Because as I said, put yourselves in the shoes of the victors, put yourselves in the shoes of those who uh, uh, were alive at the end of Uhud. How much would they say? What would they say? They would only say one or two incidents here and there. And then human beings, they don't like to dwell on bad memories. They want to mention good memories more. And so we don't know too much about Uhud. In any case, one of the things that we know, and of course the primary cause of the change of tide, was the fact that when the Mushrikun fled, the Sahaba... Uh, felt complacent enough to let go of their arms, to put them away, and start collecting all of the uh, war booty. And we can imagine, we don't have the details, we can imagine what would be left behind. Most important and the most prized possessions are good weapons. Good weapons are hard to come by, and generally speaking, they are imported from other lands. And anything that is imported is very expensive. The Arabs were not the best of ironsmiths. They were not the best of weapon makers. The Arabs exported back then, not oil, but they exported tanned leather, they exported other goods from the desert, they exported dates, but they would import weapons. So weapons are very expensive and they lasted a generation, they lasted a long time. Maybe even to the next generation it will be inherited. So weapons is the number one thing. Tents as well. Animals, if the mushrikun fled and left a camel, a camel is worth a lot of money. So when they saw this ghanima, when they saw this uh, war booty and the mushrikun had fled, so they discarded their arms and they began collecting to go back to camp and collect again. And we need to understand that the rules of ghanima had not yet been fully finalized. No doubt, some of the rules had come at Badr. Some of them had come. But... At Badr, there were only a few of the Sahaba compared to war at Uhud. One half of them were less than one half. And even at Badr, only some of the rules are revealed. And so the Sahaba were not aware that technically speaking, every single person is going to get the same share of the Ghanima. The whole Ghanima is basically collected and then everybody gets a share of the Ghanima. So, uh, and this is, uh, this is the Ghanima that you don't... Uh, get from the, if, if a warrior kills another warrior in Islamic fiqh, then he will get the possessions of that warrior immediately, 
right? But if the battle, if the enemy flees and the thing is left behind, that which is left behind, no one person will take. It doesn't matter if you snatch it. This is a major sin to snatch it and kite it. This is ghalul. This is uh, basically stealing from the, from the war booty. That type of ghanima is left. Or you collect it and you give it in one pile. And then that pile is distributed equally. Uh, well, not quite equally. Uh, those who have a horse or animal and they own it will get more. But the point is that's not relevant to uh, you know, uh, how much you collect it with your hands. So the sad part really is that those who were eager for this war booty, subhanAllah, they didn't get their share because they thought this would be our share, right? And they caused the disaster that they caused. So being greedy for elements of this dunya, they neither got this dunya because that share was not theirs. Even if you collected as much as you could, that's not your property. That's not yours to keep. It has to go back to the pile and it will be distributed evenly. They neither got this, nor of course did they get the better reward. Uh, and that is the uh, victory of the battle. And this is the reality. There's a symbolism here. This is the reality of those who prefer the dunya over anything else. They neither get this nor that. And this is a uh, huge symbolic issue of the battle of uh, Uhud. In any case, so when the archers saw the uh, Muslims collecting the booty and coming back to camp. Now what this means, by the way, this we have to draw from the inferences. The Quraysh are nowhere to be seen. Khalas, they've gone. So what this means is we're not talking about two, three minutes. We're talking about at least a good 20 minutes have gone by. 30 minutes have gone by. There's a feeling of complacency now. There's a feeling that khalas, it's over. We've won. And the archers are waiting, 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 and nobody sends them a message. And they're seeing all of the other Muslims collect the ghanima. And this is where shaitan got to them, right? That they're waiting and waiting and waiting and no messenger comes. Uh, because from the Prophet's perspective, the battle's not over yet. That's the whole point. He understood it's too early to call it a victory. We need to wait. We need to be patient. So from his perspective, they need to stay there. And he has told them they need to remain until the, the command comes. So from the perspective of the archers, they feel now neglected. That the other Muslims, and they're at the top of this massive hill, they can see all the way to the end. And they see all of these tents, and all of these weapons, and all of these animals, and they see all of this food, whatever else they had. And they are collecting all of this ghanima. And so, they began disputing amongst themselves, as you know, and this is what Allah refers to. That, وَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ This is one of the tanaza' that happened. A number of differences happened between the Muslims. Um, a number of uh, yani debates happened between the Muslims and this is one of them. That the, the archers began debating amongst themselves. And we only have one or two phrases recorded, but again we can use our imagination and be a bit more realistic. That it wasn't just one conversation. That the archers are now having a constant back and forth. Come on, it's our turn, let's go. Another group says, no, no, we can't go now. And of course, Abdullah ibn, ja uh, Abdullah ibn Jubair says that, have you forgotten what the Prophet ﷺ told you? That, Kunu makanakum, stay where you are until my command comes to you. By Allah, I will not move my place until the command comes to me. I will not move my place until the command comes to me. And again, we can imagine, the books don't mention, but we can imagine this type of bickering must have gone on for quite a while. Because nobody just changes their mind in a millisecond. Right? You go back and forth, you have you see how many people follow your position, it's human nature. If you're all alone, khalas, you stick with the jama'ah. But if you get more and more people, you feel confident. And so we can imagine that from the 50, perhaps in the beginning only one or two are, are, are basically raising the banner to go and, and participate. Slowly but surely, perhaps over 40 minutes, perhaps over an hour, we don't know how long. But it cannot be immediate. It's not something that happened in a millisecond. After a period of time, Eventually, 40 of the people are now saying, come on, let's go. Enough is enough. Now, 40 is basically, you know, 80%, right? 40 out of 50 is 80%. That's a huge majority. And therefore, they descended on their horses and their, uh, uh, some of them had horses, some, some of them didn't. They descended down and they left only 10 people on the mountain. And of course, this is the Fursa, this is the opportunity that Khalid ibn Walid saw. So what does this mean? This means that Khalid ibn Walid, even as he is fleeing, even as he's fleeing, he is not running for dear life. He is fleeing, but cautiously. And he's looking behind to see what he can do. And this uh, shows us the military genius that he had, that the only 
uh, the only person who ever inflicted a genuine loss on the Muslims was Khalid ibn al-Walid. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him to basically convert and, and, and join the ranks of Muslims. Otherwise, in the uh, you know, uh, uh, Mecca and the Medina period, excuse me, the only person who inflicted a military uh, loss and a military uh, uh, defeat upon the Muslims is Khalid ibn al-Walid. And this shows us he really is a military genius. And we know Khalid has a stellar career ahead of him. We know, we know this, that... He is the one who uh, carved out basically most of the Muslim empire. That one conquest after another, this was Khalid ibn Walid. And he is showing, even as a young man, he's in his early 20s now. He's showing, and this is his first real battle, the battle of Uhud. He wasn't uh, participating in the battle of Badr, he was not there. This is his first real battle, and we see now the military genius. Some people, they have it. Allah blesses certain people with talents. Khalid had that talent. And so, you can imagine, he's looking back, he's seeing, what can I do, what can I do? And as soon as he sees the 40 people go down, immediately his brain goes into uh, you know, action. He knows exactly what needs to be done. And this means as well that he would have realized that the area we showed you in the map last Wednesday, that area is now empty. And as I said now, here is where we get uh, two analyses, the first of which you, we find in many books, and that is that uh, Khalid ibn Walid went behind the mountain of Uhud. But as I said, this honestly does not make any academic sense. It is an impossible position to hold. If you actually see the mountain of Uhud, and then to go all the way around it, by car will take you 45 minutes. By car. So can you imagine by horse and by, and many of them didn't have horses, they're on their, they're walking. It's really impossible to imagine six, seven hours are going to go by. That's a bit too much. Because by then, even the Muslims would have packed up and gone if nothing happens for that long, right? So realistically then, it wasn't that Khalid went from all the way behind. We showed you the maps last Wednesday. Rather, when he saw from the distance what is happening, he launched a frontal assault, but obviously he didn't charge. He basically carved his way in uh, from the uh, right-hand side. Basically, we can imagine like a U-turn, right? Going a little bit out so nobody sees him. And this is what Sheikh Safir Rahman also, he demonstrated for us that the, the most realistic uh, course of events was that there is a, a, a valley, as I showed you in the map last Wednesday, that uh, it kind of goes underneath the land, obviously. So if you enter into this, this not a valley, I already, we tried less time to talk about this waterway, empty waterway, right? The, the channel uh, that f fills up in the time of rain. If you're in this, then people cannot see you at ground level, because you're obviously underneath, right? So this is Sheikh Safi Rahman's interpretation, which makes more sense. That this is how Khalid managed to get together a group, and then he entered this ditch, and he walked uh, with his people. Uh, and how many did he have? We have no idea. But again, we estimate, we think, we try to analyze the situation, and a rough estimate that makes sense is probably around 100. Or maximum 150. It couldn't really be more than that or else the damage would have been much more. right? It couldn't have been less than that or else he wouldn't have been able to inflict that much damage. So we have a good quantity of people that have come in. Now, again, I hope you remember the, uh, the map. Uh, so the problem here is that when Khalid bin Walid is coming back from behind the mountain, in effect, he is having... Or, or if you like, uh, cutting the Muslim army into half, right? Because he's basically walking in, and on his right side will be the camp of the Prophet ﷺ, and on his left side will be the Muslims who are collecting ghanima, right? So in reality, what he's done is he's effectively cut off the strength of the Muslims that they had utilized when they were fighting in one jabha, in one uh, vicinity, right? I hope you remember the map because I didn't ask for it this time around. But again, just think of it when you think of the mountain, you come back in. Where we said that the Prophet was camped right in the corner and three areas are protecting him, right? Now this protection turns against them because they're blocked off. And that's why the Prophet understood the danger of an attack from this side. This protection, which was their protection, turns against the Muslims. Because now Khalid and Walid is coming with his sudden entourage, his sudden uh, group, and they have nowhere to flee. Because they're effectively cut off. Similarly, the Muslims in front are dispersed. They're not in one group. 
They're cut off from their main uh, supplies. We also can infer that many of them had abandoned their armor. Many of them didn't even have their weapons because again, they're now collecting ghanima. They were piling up things and when you're piling up ghanima, you're not going to have a sword in one hand. All, all, under, again, these are not mentioned, but we extrapolate. We use our common sense that they would have taken their armor off. They would have put their weapons back in their tents. Now they're going back and they're collecting ghanima. An hour has gone by. Hour and a half has gone by and they're feeling very complacent. Khalas is all over. But an hour and a half is not enough time. An hour and a half is just enough time for Khalid to see what's happening and uh, come back around. And he attacks them, uh, uh, as we said, from behind Jabal al Ruma. And uh, the first person to uh, see Khalid ibn al Walid, in fact, it was none other than the Prophet. The first person to monitor what is going on is the Prophet. And this shows us that, in fact, uh, and again, we're surmising this, that in fact he felt uneasy at this situation. That he is being extra cautious, whereas the Sahaba are being complacent. And it was in his nature to obviously take every precaution. And while the Sahaba have basically thought, Khalas, it's over now, the Prophet is monitoring as carefully as possible. And he was the first person to uh, see the flank coming in, a uh, surprise attack coming in. And it is human instinct that when you see an enemy coming, you turn around and flee. It's also very dangerous for the Prophet to give his own location away because he knows he is the center of target. He is the one that they're targeting. And therefore, we can imagine if any one of us had been in a similar situation, we would have immediately fled surreptitiously and quietly, not drawn attention to ourselves. But this is not any one of us, this is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore he did what we would only expect him to do, which is the bravest thing imaginable. And that is he stood up and at the top of his lungs, he started shouting for the Muslims that, uh, oh Muslims behind you, he who is he speaking to now? He's speaking to those who are in the battlefield. And he's yelling as loud as he can, that be careful, they're, they're, they're attacking from behind you. Right? That, uh, take your heather, take your precautions. They're coming from behind. And so by yelling out, he's effectively given his own coordinates away. Because everybody knows, uh, you know, the voice of the Prophet. I mean, who else is going to be commanding them? All Muslims. Everybody recognizes his voice. So by shouting at the top of his lungs, he's done uh, something that is really extremely brave. And that is to give away his own coordinates. But had he not given this warning, probably the, the massacre would have been double or triple than it was, right? That at least by giving this warning, some people could take precautions and take up their arms and put on their armor. And this is what uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. And again, we're going to talk about all of these verses in detail uh, in a future, uh, uh, maybe next Wednesday or the Wednesday after that. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ تُصْعِدُونَ وَلَا تَلْوُونَ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ وَالرَّسُولُ يَدْعُوكُمْ فِي أُخْرَاكُمْ Right? Recall, remember, when you were uh, basically fleeing on uh, onto the mountains, right? And you were not caring about anybody. You weren't looking about anybody. And your Prophet was calling you from your back, from your behind. Right at the back, he was calling you to come. Right? And so Allah Azza describes vividly the uh, reality of the situation that when some of the Sahaba saw the surprise attack, they started fleeing, which is the human instinct to do, which is what I said, that any other leader would have done that. And so Allah describes the Sahaba as running away and the Prophet ﷺ calling to the Sahaba to take precautions to come back to fight. And as can be expected, uh, such a uh, surprise attack, it led to uh, total chaos in the ranks of the uh, Muslims. The Muslims were taken totally by surprise. And some of them had not even regrouped. Some of them were basically in small pockets, four, four five, ten, maybe even uh, one or two. And as the Quran mentions, many of them, many of them, because they were unarmed, because they didn't have even groups, they simply turned their backs and fled. Just like the ladies of Quraysh had fled an hour or two hours ago, now probably on the same mountaintops, now the Muslims are fleeing. And again, Again, there's symbolism here that this is what happens when you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger. Now, uh, other Muslims uh, who were closer to the rank of Khalid ibn Walid, so they're basically closer to the camp of the uh, of the of the uh, the base of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It appears that shaitan did a, tr a trick or a tactic on them. 
And uh, shaitan wanted to cause chaos between the Muslims who are now going to face one another. So you have the Muslim uh, base, the camp, and then you have the Muslims in the battlefield, Khalid and Walid is in the middle. So what's going to happen? The two Muslims are, are armies or you know, groups are going to be facing one another. And in the chaos, some Muslims were killed at the swords of other Muslims. And we have uh, narrations that shaitan was the one who instigated this confusion. That he would trick some of the groups by basically saying that careful, the enemy is right there. And the enemy right there was none other than another Muslim group coming in. And in the chaos, in the confusion, perhaps we can also imagine, and again we are assuming that many of them were wearing helmets, let's say, right? And so they couldn't recognize who the person was. And unfortunately, uh, we had uh, some tragic deaths here. And the most tragic of these deaths was, who can tell me? <laughs> Walid Hudayfa, the father of Hudayfa, uh, and his name is, anybody who knows this deserves a prize. His name. This is a very obscure fact, not many people know. Of course, uh, they call him Yaman, but that's not his name, Hudayfa bin Yaman. La, la, you're getting confused with the, the uh, that's, that's Hamvala Ghazil al Malaika. His father is the Rahib. His uh, Hudayfa, his father was Husayl ibn Jabir. Husayl ibn Jabir. Ha, Husayl. And, uh, he was not from the Ansar, he was from the tribe of, he was from the Abbasi, he was from the tribe of Abbas, Abbasi. And in the days of Jahiliyyah, he had committed a murder, and uh, his own people basically disowned him, he had to flee from his own people, and he formed an alliance with uh, one of the tribes of Medina, who were to become the Ansar. So he formed an alliance with them, he became their Mawla, or their Halif is a better word. Uh, and so, when he formed an alliance with them, his people then started calling him Yamani. You are the one who's formed the alliance with the people of Yaman. They called the people of uh, Medina Yamani, right? And so they called him Yaman. And so his nickname became Yaman. Then he married one of the uh, ladies of Medina. We don't call them Ansar at this time because there's no Islam. And eventually when the Prophet ﷺ began preaching in Mecca, he was of the earliest converts, Yaman. He's of the earliest converts. And he accepts Islam. And then Hudayfa embraces Islam before the Prophet emigrates. So Hudayfa becomes a Muslim before the Prophet emigrates. And of course Hudayfa is famous because he is Sahibu Sir. He is the keeper of secrets. The Prophet chose him for a very noble task and that is to tell him all of the names of the hypocrites that Allah had told him. Right? So Hudayfa was known as Sahibu Sir. The keeper of secrets. The one whom the Prophet told all of the names of the uh, munafiqun to and you know the story of Umar that he came and he begged Hudayfa to tell him am I a munafiq or not and Hudayfa uh, uh, said uh, Allah, the Prophet did not mention you but I'm not going to talk to anybody else after you and it is said that perhaps he did this because he knew that the Prophet had made Umar of the ten ashara mubashara so there's no secret he's divulging if he tells Umar you are going to Jannah because he's already been told he's going to Jannah right because otherwise how can he tell a secret so he didn't tell Umar a secret he told Umar what Umar should have known already which is you are one of the Ashara Mubashara uh, in any case so his father was Husayl ibn Jabir as we said and um, what had happened in the battle of, of uh, Badr by the way so when the when the process emigrated to Medina uh, it is said that Husayl asked him a messenger of Allah am I an Ansari or a Muhajir because he's neither from Mecca nor from Medina he's actually not from either of these two cities so what am I and so the Prophet ﷺ said, you are both an Ansari and a Muhajir because he had emigrated from another land uh, to Medina and he's also living in Medina, right? So the Prophet ﷺ gave him an honor, you are an Ansari and a Muhajir. So he get the honor of being both of them. This is uh, Walidu Hudayfa, this is Yaman we're talking about. And in the Battle of Badr, uh, famous story took place as well, I mentioned this in the Battle of Badr, that Hudayfa and his father Yaman, uh, now it's unclear where were they, were they... Uh, going away from Mecca or, or the exiting Medina, it's unclear, the reports don't mention, but the Quraysh caught them on their way to the Battle of Badr. The Quraysh caught them on their way to the Battle of Badr. And the Quraysh knew that Yaman is not Ansari, he's not from Medina, and he's not obviously so, they didn't, uh, they didn't have that animosity towards him. But they said, where are you going? Uh, are you going to fight with Muhammad sallallahu And so uh, the both of them said, no, no, we're not. No, they have a sword to their throats. Would you expect them to say? They're allowed to. No, no, we're not. So they said, no, you have to promise by Allah that you are not going to fight uh, against us. You're not going to fight against us. And so 
there's a sword there, I mean there's no alternative, so they promise that they are not going to fight. So the Quraysh left them. They make their way to the Prophet ﷺ, and they tell them the story. And the Prophet ﷺ says, go fulfill your promise, go back to Medina. That's a very important story here, right? Go fulfill your promise, you made a promise. You cannot fight with us, go back to Medina. And so, Hudayfa and Yaman, they got the reward of Badr without actually being at Badr. So again, another blessing, right? Their niyyah was there. They got to Badr, but they weren't allowed to fight because of the promise. And this also shows us, by the way, when you have a specific promise, even with an enemy, uh, and you have made a specific promise to them, then in this case, it is not allowed to break your promise in this manner because we are not allowed to break our promises. And this is very relevant to uh, modern political issues, but that's a tangent I've been into before. Uh, so, uh, where was I? Hudayfa and his father. What else do we need to know about Hudayfa before we move on? Uh, so, yes, so Hudayfa, by this age, he's now very elderly. He's losing his eyesight. Uh, he's one of the two people, well, there's only two people, that at the Battle of Uhud, they were so old, the Prophet ﷺ said, go and stay in the city, don't fight with us. So Hudayfa is one of those, we can imagine him feeble and old. He is so old that they are exempt from fighting. So Hudayfa and this other man from the Ansar, they uh, were sitting basically with the women and children. And obviously what happens, their manhood gets the better of them, their iman gets the better of them. And they start rebuking each other and themselves. Like, how can we do this? What is the point? And Hudayfa says, how long do we have left to live? A day, an hour? I mean, we're so old now. How long do we have left to live? And his companion says, you are right. Let us go and perhaps Allah will end our lives with the shahada, which is what we want. Right? Yaman. Did I say Hudayfa? Sorry. Yaman. Yaman's the elderly person, right? Yaman's the, the old person. So, Yaman, sorry, I, I, you're right, I'm sorry. Yaman and uh, another of the Ansar. They're both elderly and they uh, both decide to make their way to Uhud after they have been basically exempt from coming to Uhud. There's one problem. By the time they come, this is when Khalid is now attacking. So, they come at a chaotic time and they join the battle at a time of chaos. And this was when shaitan cries out that, O oh Muslims, behind you. And when they turned around, there was Yaman standing right there. And so a group of them not recognizing Yaman because he was not in the battle in the morning, he wasn't there. A group of them not recognizing Yaman, they surrounded him and they began uh, using their swords and Hudayfa recognized his, his father because obviously a father recognizes his son, the son recognizes his father. As we know, you recognize your children and vice versa simply by the back of their heads or by yani one limb or something. This is the way that Allah created. You recognize, right? So he recognizes his father from the distance. And he began screaming that, the, Abi, Abi, this is my father. This is my father. Stop from doing this. But they're not going to hear the dint of the battle, the emotions, the fear. Everything is just the, the battle. And they struck him and they uh, basically killed him. It was a sad and tragic uh, story. And uh, at the end of the battle, when it was all over, uh, they came and asked forgiveness. And Hudayfa said, Yaghfirullahu lakum wa huwa arhamur rahimin. Surah Yusuf, same thing. Yaghfirullahu lakum wa huwa arhamur rahimin. And the Prophet ﷺ paid him the blood money for his father from the Baytul Mal. That this is our fault. The Muslim, even though it's not his fault, the problem, but it's responsibility of the Muslim Ummah. So he paid him the blood money, which is a hundred camels, which is a lot of money. And Hudayfa took this money and he distributed it to the fuqara. All of it. And this obviously made him, yani obviously uh, the way who he was. And as one of the Sahaba said, that uh, Hudayfa forever lived in good after that incident. That that incident was what boosted his ranks. He always lived in good up until the end of his life. And the Prophet ﷺ then rewarded him by making him Sahib al-Sir, the one who took the secrets of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, as we said, it's a very chaotic situation and all we can do is to mention specific incidents that happened. And of course, the saddest incident of, uh, or one of the saddest incidents of Uhud is the death of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the death of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, and also a very uh, close friend. And 
uh, someone whom uh, had defended the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, if you remember his conversion story, do you remember his conversion story? That he actually converted hamiyyatan. He converted uh, out of family pride. He didn't convert out of actual iman in the beginning. He converted because Abu Jahl had insulted his nephew. Right? And he got so angry that somebody could insult his family that just on the spur he said, did you insult him? And he didn't even realize, as the riwayah go, he didn't even realize what he's saying. But once he blurts it out, he's not going to take it back. Right? And then after that, his iman became stronger and stronger until he becomes Sayyid al-Shuhada. He becomes Sayyid al-Shuhada. And the story is of course known to all of us, but there's no harm in repeating it again. Because after all, really these are the stories that yani, increase our iman. They make us understand how the sacrifices that our ummah uh, uh, went through, the sacrifices of our Prophet ﷺ himself. Uh, we know that of course, uh, Hamza was killed by Wahshi. And who was Wahshi? Wahshi was the slave of Jubayr ibn Mut'im. Jubayr ibn Mut'im. Now, uh, Jubayr ibn Mut'im, Mut'im ibn Adi, we talked a lot, a lot about. Mut'im ibn Adi, we talked about what a noble person he was, right? But father and son can be different. Jubayr eventually accepts Islam, so we say radiallahu anhu, but at the time he's not a Muslim. So, uh, Jubayr ibn Mut'im, now his father Mut'im, we mentioned. He was the most noble of the whole Quraysh who opposed the Prophet after Abu Talib. So Abu Talib and Mutam ibn Adi are the two noble non-Muslims, right? There's only two that are genuinely good non-Muslims in a politically good sense. Not good in a theological sense, good in a political sense. So Mutam ibn uh, Abu Talib. And his son is Jubay. Now Mutam dies before Badr, Mutam doesn't see Badr. Mutam is the one the Prophet says, لو كان Mutam حيّن Right? That's Mut'im. If Mut'im had been alive, one word, and all of these are given to him. Right? That's Mut'im. This is his son. So, in the battle of Badr, Mut'im's brother, Jubair's uncle, is killed. Okay? Mut'im's younger brother, Jubair's uncle, Jubair ibn Mut'im. Jubair's uncle is uh, killed. And his name was Tu'aymah. Uh, Tu'ayma ibn Adi. So Mutim ibn Adi, Tu'ayma ibn Adi. He had been killed by Hamza. So Hamza was the one who killed Tu'ayma. So Jubair, in his uh, Hamiya, in his basically family pride, and that's what they're, they, they're, they are used to, that family issue, he killed my uncle, khalas, he's going to die for that. So Jubair tells his slave Wahshi, that look, if you kill Hamza, then you will get your freedom. And so it's a uh, double, if you like, revenge. First revenge is you kill the uncle of the Prophet just like my uncle was killed. And the second, the same person, you kill the person who killed my uncle. You see the point here, there's two, there's two motivations here, right? Just like I lost my uncle, the Prophet is going to lose his uncle. There's a, that's motivation. And then of course there's a direct motivation. He killed my uncle, he's going to also die. So there's a double motivation for killing uh, Hamza. And Wahshi himself narrates his story. And in fact we have his story preserved in the first person. Because it is narrated that two of the Tabi'un, they visited one of the uh, cities of Iraq where Wahshi had become an old man. And uh, they visited the city and they said, let us go to Wahshi, uh, the one who killed Hamza, and ask him how he killed Hamza. And so the two of them, uh, their names uh, are mentioned in the books, but we have not come across them, so there's no point confusing you. Uh, the two of them, uh, they entered it upon Hamza, uh, sorry, Wahshi, excuse me, they entered it upon Wahshi, and Wahshi had grown almost uh, blind. And it is said that he looked at the feet uh, of one of them, and immediately said, are you so-and-so the son of so-and-so? And he said, yes, I am. So he said, I played with your feet when you were a baby in Mecca. I played with you as a baby in Mecca, meaning. I played with you as a baby in Mecca. So subhanAllah, the Arabs had a, a science, by the way, of feet reading. You know this or, you know this, huh? They had a science of feet reading. Uh, and uh, this is, they would tell nasab, they would tell genealogy by looking at the feet. They would tell genealogy by looking at the feet. Uh, and, uh, and there are stories in the seerah about this as well. Uh, Usama and Zayd were lying down under one blanket. Right? Usama ibn Zayd. Usama and Zayd were lying down under one blanket. And uh, Usama was dark-skinned. 
And Zayd was light skinned. Why was Usama dark skinned? Because his mother is. His mother is who? Um Mubaraka. Uh, his mother is an Abyssinian slave, and uh, Zayd is an Arab, and uh, Usama came uh, to, uh, like his mother. And you know how people are, they started speaking, you know, there was a rumor going on, you know, when Usama was born. And Usama and Zayd were uh, lying under a blanket, this is in Sahih Bukhari. And one of these feet readers came, and they're covered up. So he said, these feet are from these feet. Usama is the son of this person. But he, just, he doesn't know who they are. And Aisha says the Prophet ﷺ was so happy to hear this. That, you know, this type of rumor will be finished now, right? Even though he doesn't need to hear, but the people need to hear this, right? Again, I'm going to my tangents. Let's get back here. So he looks at the feet of this person. He goes, verily, I played with your feet. Meaning, I played with you when you were a baby, right? So what do you want from me? And so he says, we have come to uh, listen to you how you killed uh, Hamza. So he said, I will tell you exactly word for word as I told the Prophet ﷺ. So he tells them the entire story. And he says that, I was a slave in Mecca, and I had no desire to fight or kill. I have no desire to get involved in the war. However, my master Jubayr promised me my freedom if I killed Hamza. And so I, I took my best javelin, my best spear, and I went into the battle, and wallahi, I had no desire to do anyone harm except for Hamza in order to get my freedom. I have no hatred against him, so he's making an excuse. I'm not, I didn't want to participate, it's nothing, something that I have, I just wanted to be a free man, right? And we understand uh, that type of, of uh, emotion, that he simply wanted to be a free man. So he said, I began following Hamza. Wherever he's going, I'm uh, following Hamza to see what he is doing. And I kept on uh, hiding from him to, uh, to uh, go behind him, until finally, he said that when Hamza killed so and so, and he mentions one of the Quraysh, so Hamza, by the way, had killed a whole list, even in Uhud. Hamza had killed a long list. So when Hamza killed so and so, he chopped him off. As soon as he lowered the sword, he, Hamza, uh, Wahshi is saying, I stepped out from behind the bush. So he's literally hiding behind the bush, right? I stepped out from behind the bush, his back was to him. I mean, this is really low. I mean, but he's not caring about chivalry right now. He doesn't care about fighting like a man. He just wants his freedom. So Hamza's back was towards him and he said, I threw my javelin with the most force that I could. So this is point blank range. You're killing from the back. There is simply no way. So he says, it came, and now this is, can you imagine, well, like, can you imagine the force that he must have thrown the javelin with? He said, it came out from behind, and it came into the front, and the javelin was literally half in the body now, right? That is force. And Hamza, uh, Wahshi says, Hamza turned around to try to fight me. Subhanallah, what a man. What a man. The javelin is sticking out, right? Turned around to try to fight me, but... Before he could raise his sword, yani, you're not going to live this, this thing. He simply collapsed right there and uh, died before he could, uh, you know, before he could uh, uh, do anything. Um, it is also said, by the way, that uh, uh, Wahshi uh, aimed to uh, an area that is between his, his armor, like in the, uh, in the, in a, the armor chinks, what are you going to call it? Like, you know, the place that is not fully covered. You know, the armors in those days, they were coats, they were rings. Right? So Wahshi is an expert javelin thrower. So he's aiming to see when the armor basically slides here or there, or there's a little bit of a hole. And this is not too far-fetched either for someone as skilled as Wahshi, that he actually is aiming for an area that uh, Hamza would not even have had any armor. And this would make sense, the force that it is now coming out one. And subhanAllah, we can say, how else would Hamza have been killed? Nobody could kill him in one-on-one -on -one combat. Nobody could have killed him like a man. How else would he be killed except in this uh, manner which is not a noble manner. It's not the manner that you do one-on-one -on -one battle with. But again, Wahshi doesn't care and he makes an excuse for himself. I had no, I didn't care about Hamza at all. I simply wanted my uh, freedom. And uh, it, also it is amazing as well that Jubair, uh, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him to Islam eventually as well. That Jubair ibn Mut'im, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him with Islam and he becomes a Sahabi and his sins are forgiven. Uh, and by the way, Jubair, he was one of the prisoners at Badr. And uh, Jubair says, that's the first time a little bit of Iman entered my heart. 
was when I heard the Prophet ﷺ recite Surah at tur So remember, where were the prisoners housed? In the masjid. So all of the prisoners are in the masjid. So he's tied up to the pillar of the masjid, Jubair. And uh, you can imagine every day the Prophet and the Sahaba are coming to pray salah. So he says, the first time Iman entered my heart was when the Prophet recited Surah at tur in Salat al-Maghrib. And he got to the verse, Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in? Now again, Surah Al-Tur, just like Surah Al-Najm, it's a powerful surah. It builds up to a, a crescendo, like an amazing ending. There's a series of like 15 rhetorical questions at the end, just like Surah Al-Najm, by the way, as well. It's very powerful. And one of the last, right at the end of it, which is basically Allah is saying, where did you come from? Did you come out of nowhere or did you create yourselves? Right? So, Jubayr ibn Mut'im said that when I heard the process of doing that tilawa, my heart was about to break out of my chest and just fly out, right? Can you imagine the tilawah of the Prophet how it would have impacted, right? So Jubayr ibn Mut'im said, this was the first time that Iman entered my heart, but Allah had willed he's not going to accept Islam now. Not at Uhud, because he has things to do for the sake of history, for the sake of wisdom Allah knows. So he's not a Muslim yet, but eventually he will accept uh, Islam. Um, uh, Wahshi, by the way, uh, there's stuff that is generally not mentioned uh, too often in popular lectures, but I feel that there's always wisdom in mentioning uh, what Allah Azza wa has allowed our tradition to preserve. Uh, wahshi, there's also some dark side as well. Uh, and inshallah, Allah will forgive him and all of us. He is after all a sahabi and he repented from that sin. Uh, wahshi, when the Prophet conquered Mecca, so Wahshi fled to Ta'if. Because he knows, I mean, everybody knows how devastated the Prophet was. This is his uncle, it's his beloved. Wahshi knows, he's not going to spare me. So Wahshi, before the Prophet comes, he flits to Ta'if. Ta'if, of course, remains non-Muslim for another year, and he's in there. Then, the next year, Ta'if also caves in, as we're going to come to when we come to. And so Ta'if sends a delegation. Wahshi says, I had no idea what to do. I felt the whole world is going to collapse on me. And I decided to go into exile in Syria until finally somebody said to me, Wayhaka ya wahshi, won't you, O wahshi, don't you know that if you accept this man's religion, he never kills anybody who accepts his own religion? So he said, I decided to accept Islam. So obviously, yani, he's accepting it for a reason that is understandable, but it's not the reason that, let's say, Abu Bakr Umar accepted Islam, right? So he said, I decided to accept Islam. And so I hid myself, the covering that the Bedouins do, you know, the talattama, the, the, you know, the uh, covering of the face, right? So I hid myself in my turban, and I made my way to Mecca, and I came into the Prophet wasallam, and I unfolded the turban, because he knows he's going to be killed on sight. And before anybody could say anything, he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu annaka rasulullah. So the Prophet ﷺ says, A wahshiyun ant, you are wahshi. Because Ahmad recognizes who he recognizes who he is, and so he says, "Yes, I am Wahshi." So he says, "Come and tell me how you killed Hamza." Subhanallah. Come and tell me how you killed Hamza. And so uh, Wahshi told him how he killed Hamza, and Wahshi says the Prophet cried until his beard became wet. So he is crying now when he hears this uh, detailed story. Uh, here is the man who did this, and then he said uh, to Wahshi, uh, "Hide yourself from me. Let me not see your face." Hide yourself from me, let me not see your face. Because obviously you can imagine you know, the memories that you're going to get, the, you know, the, the pain you're going to get that you killed my, you know, in this manner, you killed my uncle. I, and you know, this is even in a gentle way. He didn't say get lost or go. He simply said, hide yourself from me so I don't see you. So Wahshi would always, you know, what a punishment, we seek Allah's refuge, but what a difficult punishment in this world, right? That anytime he sees the Prophet he has to go behind the pillar, he has to hide behind somebody. He does not, he is not allowed to uh, come in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, there's another thing that I said that not many people like to mention, but it is reported in all of our classical books and there is wisdom in this and as I said Allah will forgive uh, him uh, and inshallah all of us as well. We are all uh, sinful in our own ways. Uh, that uh, Wahshi was known for uh, being involved in drinking till the end of his days. And Umar had him punished multiple times. So much so that Umar said that Wallahi I knew that Allah would not leave Qatilu Hamza untouched. Wallahi I knew that Allah would not leave the one who killed Hamza without some issue. 
Right? Some, some issue, some punishment, something like this. I knew Allah was not going to leave him like this, that he's done something so big, it's not going to be left untouched. And so, uh, he was punished multiple times. Now, of course, uh, you know, drinking, uh, according to Islamic fiqh, you are basically lashed, uh, you know, uh, 40 times. Uh, and there's no, like, you know, every time you drink, you're just lashed. So you keep on lashed. So Wahji was lashed a number of times until Hamza, I mean, Umar got irritated at him. and said, Wallahi, I knew Allah was not going to leave Qatilu, Hamza. However, at the end of his life, uh, he did uh, repent and um, it is said that when, uh, well not it is said, he said himself. And so when he's describing to these two uh, young men in front of him, he said when he heard about Musaylam al-Kadhab, when he heard about Musaylam al-Kadhab, he said, he made a dua to Allah that, Oh Allah, allow me to take the life of Musaylam in substitution for what I did to Hamza. Like this is my kafara. Right? So he said, SubhanAllah, I took the same spear that I killed Hamza with. The same spear. I took the same spear that I killed Hamza with. And I went with Khalid and Walid. Now he is an old man now. Right? This is many years later now that he is talking about this. Or well, maybe not old, but he's not the young person that he was. You know, a decade or more has gone uh, in the battle of Musaylama. Right? So I went now with Khalid and Walid and I targeted Musaylama like I targeted Hamza. Right? And he says that when I uh, was in front of him, I threw my javelin and at the same time, one of the Ansar attacked him from the other side with his sword. So Allah knows which of the two actually killed. So both of them basically simultaneously came upon Musaylam al kadhab So he says Allah knows which of the two of us uh, killed him, but he considered this to be his kafara. That because of this, I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. And of course, technically, he did this when he was a non-Muslim. So it's not as if that sin will be on his, uh, you know, mawazin uh, 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 on the Day of Judgment. But nonetheless, can you imagine the guilt he would have felt, right? Can you imagine the guilt he would have felt? And this is what he wanted to do, uh, you know, in, in, in return for what he had done. And as I said, may Allah forgive. And inshallah, Allah will forgive him. He is a Sahabi. And by the way, this leads us to a, a theological issue. Some people get uh, confused when they hear uh, a Sahabi did this or that. And they do not realize that the Sahaba are human. And they are the best generation, no doubt. But that doesn't make them superhuman. So the Sahaba also have some of the problems that everybody else does. After all, were there not people who committed zina in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ and they were punished, correct? Right? Were there not people who, uh, you know, physically fought in the masjid? We know they argued in the masjid. Things are happening over money, over this or that. They are, after all, humans, but as a generation, they are the best. And we differentiate between pointing out one of these types of uh, sins or, 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 or issues in order to uh, basically show their humanity versus pointing them out in order to denigrate them, right? Allah says in the Quran, in the Quran رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن, as a generation. And so every Sahabi we say رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن. And we say that no matter what sin the Sahaba would do, there is one sin that Allah has protected them from. And that is the sin of lying about Allah and His Messenger. And that is very true by the way. So the sin of basically being unfaithful to Allah and His Messenger, they cannot do that. But other issues, which are human issues, zina, khamr, this is getting angry, fighting, this is human issue, right? And the Sahaba, yani some of them, they fell into these issues. And it, the fact that they fell into it does not diminish from radiallahu anhum wa an, right? As a category, they are radiallahu anhum wa an, but this doesn't mean that they are superhuman, and so this issue of Wahshi should, should, should be put into this uh, context. Uh, now we also know, by the way, that when uh, Wahshi was uh, uh, had had killed uh, Hamza, uh, we all know what uh, Hind did on the battlefield. So, by the way, what this shows, uh, and a lot of people don't uh, put this uh, together, Hamza was killed in the victory half of Uhud, not in the losing half. Right? Hamza was killed in the first. 20, 30 minutes basically, right? Uh, or hour, how will, I mean, I'm not giving an exact time frame, but before Khalid comes in, Hamza was killed in the uh, initial assault that Wahshi is monitoring from the very beginning. So this is an important point. Khalid and Walid is coming and Hamza has already been mutilated, right? Because before Hind runs away, what does Hind do? We all know what she does uh, and 
she also accepted Islam, so Allah has forgiven her as well. And this is Allah's wisdom. He chooses whom He wants. That as a, uh, a sign of uh, pure hatred, as a sign of inflicting pain upon the Prophet ﷺ, because there is no other reason to do this, right? As a sign of infl inflicting pain upon the Prophet ﷺ, she, uh, she basically, with her own dagger, she cuts open, slits open the stomach of Hamza, and takes out his liver, and bites it and sp spits it out, right? And, it's a bit disgusting, she cuts off his fingers. Cuts off his fingers, and according to some reports, his toes, and she built a necklace out of them. She built a necklace out of them. And again, all of this is done in order to, nothing except to inflict pain upon the Prophet ﷺ, there's no other reason to do this, right? And this is the level of, of hatred, the level of, you know, at that time they had, and it is amazing that Allah decided to guide her this, we say, we say Allah knows best. We say we trust in Allah's judgment, right? Somebody that had so much hiqd and so much anger, still for a wisdom known to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides that after the conquest of Mecca, she will uh, basically embrace Islam along with Abu Sufyan. Of course, Hind is the wife of Abu Sufyan, right? And so she is like the, the queen. She is the prime lady of Quraysh, right? So she is making that statement that this is who we are and this is what we're going to do to you. And when our Prophet ﷺ saw the body of Hamza, he uh, cried, and this of course after all of the battle is over, after he cried and he said, were it not for the fact that Safiya would grieve. Now Safiya and Hamza are full brothers and sisters, not half, full, the same parents. Safiya and Hamza are full brother and sister, and so they have an even closer bond. Were it not for the fact that Safiya's heart would grieve, and the people uh, would then take this as sunnah, if I were to do this, I would have left his body untouched. I would have left his body untouched until <coughs> it dispersed in the beasts of bel uh, in the beasts of bellies and uh, the bellies of the beasts and the birds. I.e., I want his body to be plucked even more, so that Allah honors him even more, and so that Allah will then collect his body from all of these different places as an honor for Hamza. Right. So what the Prophet is saying is that were it not for Safiya's grief. And for the fact that what I'm doing would then become sunnah, and this is another issue that ishtihad that he made right then and there, and that if I had done this, it would have become sunnah, but I don't want to open that door, I would have left his body untouched. And I would have let it decompose and let the animals come to literally, she thinks she's cut off the fingers, let him be dispersed in a million places. Then let Allah gather him from all of those million as a karama, as a blessing, as a means of honoring Hamza. This is what I would have done, but I didn't want to do that because of these two reasons. And then he says, and he said that, and if Allah ever gives me victory over the Quraysh, I shall mutilate 30 of their bodies because of this one. So he said this, he said, I shall mutilate 30 for one. 30 Juthath, I will mutilate for this one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed later on after Uhud that wa in aqabatum fa'aqibu bi mithli ma uqibatum bih. Wala in sabartum lahu wa khayru li sabiri. If you're gonna take revenge, take revenge exactly equivalent as what happened to you. But if you are patient and forgive, it is better. If you are Turn the other cheek, it is better for you, for those who forgive, for those who are patient. And so when this ayah came down, the Prophet ﷺ, he gave a permanent commandment that no dead body should ever be mutilated. So this shows us that the Prophet ﷺ made ishtihad and Allah corrects him. This also shows us that uh, mutilation has been forbidden uncategorically uncategorically, it has been forbidden. So initially, the Prophet ﷺ said, I will take revenge. But he never actually did it, right? It's just, it's just a, uh, a threat that if I get victory, I shall mutilate 30 bodies. Then Allah revealed, turn the other cheek, forgive, it is better. So then the Prophet ﷺ took this from Allah and he said, Khalas, from now on, it is not allowed to mutilate 
any dead body, Muslim or Kafir, it doesn't matter. We don't mutilate bodies. This is not of our tradition. And so the Prophet and the Sahaba never mutilated anybody. Even if it's not a Muslim, even as the Badr shows, you give them some type of burial, but you do not mutilate dead uh, bodies. And uh, this is the, the story of, uh, of, of Hamza. Uh, other stories as well that we know uh, is the uh, story of Mus'ab ibn Umair. And uh, Mus'ab ibn Umair, uh, when was he killed? Was he killed in the uh, offensive or when Khalid bin Walid came? Most likely, Mus'ab was killed by the forces of Khalid. And again, this is one of those issues that we're trying to piece together when things happened. Most likely, Mus'ab was killed by the forces of Khalid. And he was targeted because unlike those who were taking booty, he was still carrying the flag. So he was one of the first targets for the contingent of Khalid and Walid. Now again, we're assuming it's Khalid. The books don't mention who did it. We're just It just says this happened. But the point being, if the Muslims were so victorious in the beginning, it's difficult to imagine Mus'ab being killed so brutally. So, my ijtihad and Allah knows best, Mus'ab is killed in the second half. And that is Khalid. And this makes complete sense now. Because his story is also very gruesome. And that is that, now of course, Mus'ab is that young man we know that uh, his father was one of the richest traders of, of Mecca and he was known for being the most spoiled prince of Mecca uh, that he would wear a new qamis every day or a new garment every few days that he would buy the most expensive perfumes his mother was well known to be spoiling him completely his mother would give the best of garments and, and things to him and uh, he was tortured by his own mother and father. As you know, he was literally locked up by his own mother and father. His own mother deprived him of food and water uh, when he converted to Islam. The same woman who gave him perfumes and the most expensive garments, now that he gave up idolatry and worshipped Allah, she locked him up and deprived him of food. He had to break his chains and run away to uh, Medina. He was the first muhajir to Medina, remember, right? Because he had no house in Mecca. He had no place to live. So the Prophet sent him to Medina two years before the Hijrah. The first muhajir to Medina was Mus'ab. And his role was dual. Number one, to run away from Mecca. Number two, to preach to Medina. If you remember the story, we talked about it, right? And because he was intelligent, because he was uh, of a noble class, he knew how to interact with people, he won the hearts and mind of the Ansar. And at, at his hands, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided every single tribe had Muslims because of him. This is what the books of Sirah say. Every tribe, there were members that converted at his, at his hand. Right? So this is Mus'ab ibn Umair. And uh, he was known for being uh, gentle and, and loving. And because he was young and now he was penniless, he never got married as well. Uh, because he does not have any money at all. And uh, in the battle of Uhud, as we know, uh, he died a, a tragic death. Of course, it is an honorable death as well. And that is that uh, he was holding the flag. And... Uh, one of the mushriks came, and again, we are assuming this is Khalid's force, so he doesn't have Muslims around him to defend him, so his right hand is cut off, and he then holds the flag with his left hand, and now he is completely defenseless, the left hand is cut off, and to remain that izza, whatever he can, he takes the two stumps and then holds the flag with those stumps, and of course, he is waiting for shahada, there's nothing left for him to live, there's no defense basically, and he is killed multiple stabs and wounds simultaneously he is killed and this is why as i said it makes complete sense that this is happening in the counter offensive right this is happening when khalid is now coming in most likely and this is my reconstruction the first person they're targeting is the flag bearer because that's the whole point they need to show the symbolism we're back now khalas so the first person they target is a flag bearer musab falls a tragic death and sahih bukhari reports the long hadith of khabab ibn al arat Khabab ibn al-Arat was also one of those who was tortured in Mecca, also an early convert like Mus'ab, uh, and he lived a long life, and Allah blessed him to be a governor, and he lived in a, uh, a house and with servants, now he dies, now a very different death than what he was in, Medi in, in Mecca, right? So Allah gave him a long life. When he was about to die, Khabab gave a moving speech that caused his people and his family to cry, uh, that uh, we all emigrated with the Prophet ﷺ, seeking the rewards of Allah, and so our reward is with Allah. But some of us left this dunya without taking any of that reward in this world. Their full reward is in the hereafter. Of them is Mus'ab ibn Umair. Of them is Mus'ab ibn Umair. He was killed on the day of Uhud. And all that he had was the one garment that he was wearing. One, not even two. 
the one garment that he's wearing. So if we try to cover up his body, if we covered his bottom half, the top half was naked. And if we covered his top half, then the bottom half is naked. And so the Prophet ﷺ told us to cover up the top half and then basically maybe his thighs to downwards are left empty. We don't know exactly where, but again, when you have one garment like the ihram, let's say, so it's going to cover maybe to the thighs or something or maybe to the knees. So we then covered the top half and then we covered the bottom half with basically hay or idhkhir, not hay, but yani grass or dried up leaves or something. We covered up, uh, you know, desert grass. We put it on his feet. And as for the rest of us, he is saying, uh, we moved on in life and Allah blessed us, and now we don't know what Allah is going to do with us. Meaning, I am dying with such luxury, and my friend uh, Mus'ab died in such poverty, I don't know what my fate is going to be. As for Mus'ab, Allah gave him everything in the next. He didn't get one thing in this, uh, in this dunya. Uh, and this is of course the tragic Mus'ab ibn Umayy that uh, no doubt yani, uh, he is of those uh, shuhada in Uhud that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal uh, you know, tested him in Mecca and Allah blessed him in Medina in the way that he did to be uh, that type of shaheed. The story of Hanbal as well is known to you. We already mentioned it and it is well known. Uh, Hanbal is of course the son of Rahib now called Al-Fasiq, right? They changed his name from Rahib to Fasiq. Hanbala is the one uh, whom when uh, he was, um, it is said that Hanbala was just about to kill Abu Sufyan. That Hanbala was just striking distance of Abu Sufyan when a spear came out of nowhere and basically killed him uh, on the spot right then and there. And uh, later on after the battle, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, as you know, it is a well-known story, that uh, he said, I saw the angels washing the body of Hanbala and the body of the shaheed is not washed. So I saw the angels washing the body of Hanbala as they took him up. So go ask his wife because there's only one reason that, that they're washing. That means he must have been Junub. But why is he Junub? What's happening? And then we know the story. Of course, all of you know that he was newly married and the wife did not want him to leave and she's begging and pleading. And so basically on the morning of the battle, she tempts him right then and there. She hugs and begs him. And so he's a young man. He's newly married. So he basically uh, is intimate with her and then he doesn't even have the time to do ghusl. And so right then and there, he throws on his armor and khalas he goes on to the battle without even doing ghusl so he dies in that state so uh, he gets a much better bath mashallah he gets the bath from up there and the angels give him the ghusl uh, on the way up to uh, on the way up to uh, uh, jannah and uh, we already mentioned the story of the death of uh, yaman uh, the uh, the father of Hudayfa, where I mentioned the story of the death of uh, Yaman. Um, I'm trying to finish up. Uh, let's just go a little bit more because I want to start with the Prophet ﷺ next Wednesday. So there's two more stories, inshallah, today, and then we're done. Uh, the the other story we have is the story of uh, Quzman. Very interesting story, Quzman. Quzman was of the hypocrites, and he had gone back with Abdullah ibn Ubay. He had not wanted to fight, so he returns back. He's not. He's not of the elite of the Sahaba, Quzman. But he's also a warrior. So when he goes back, and he goes back home, the Muslim ladies began rebuking him, making fun of him. They said, what type of man are you? You leave the men in the battlefield and you come back home to us? Have you no shame? And so he felt such an embarrassment that the ladies are mocking me if I come home. So then he decided to return back. But what's his niya now? His niyyah was not for the sake of Allah. And so his niyyah is basically to prove my manhood. So he returns back to the battle, completely armed, and Quzman was a warrior. And uh, he fights a very tough and a very brave fighting. So much so, that one of the Sahaba comes back to the Prophet so we, we understand this is happening the offensive then, the first half. Comes back to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, Quzman is fighting an amazing battle. It's like praising him. Wherever he goes, he's wreaking havoc. The Prophet said, Huwa finnar. Huwa finnar. He's going to be in the fire of hell. The Sahabi says, I got a shock like I had never gotten before. Like this man who's fighting this battle, if he's going to hell, what's, what's, you know, what's wrong? Something must be wrong here. Right? So he said, I decided to follow him. I decided to follow him. Like there must be a reason. And so Tatabatuha began following uh, Quzman and eventually Quzman was hit by an arrow and he began wailing out of pain until not being able to bear the pain of one arrow, which I'm sure is very painful, may Allah protect us all, but the Sahaba, we just saw Mus'ab and others, what they have done. 
right? We're not comparing his to us. We are much weaker than all of this, but we're comparing him to the people of his generation, right? We just seen all of these other Sahaba, what they're doing. So one arrow comes and hits him somewhere in the limb or something like this. He cannot bear the pain. So what does he do? He takes out his sword and he turns it upside down and he puts the handle on the ground. He puts the sharp side on his stomach and then he jumps on his own sword because he doesn't want to bear the pain. So he commits suicide because of the pain, right? And as we all know, no, none of the Sahaba, as we know, is the Astaghfirullah. I mean, none of them ever did this, right? It's ridiculous, unmanly. It is un-Islamic. Khuzman is committing suicide on the battlefield because of an arrow. And so immediately the man came back and informed the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what happened. Uh, and of course, yani this affirmed their iman that he predicted Khuzman is going to go to the fire of hell. And the Prophet sallam said. Sometimes Allah helps this religion through an evil man. Khuzman helped us, but he's an evil man. Khuzman helped us, he's fighting on our side, but he is an evil man. And uh, two more very small stories. Uh, the first story is this, uh, or the second to last story, is the story of Al Usayrim Amr ibn Thabit. Al Usayrim Amr ibn Thabit. Al Usayrim was one of the very few uh, remaining pagans. Now, this is a bit problematic for me because Ibn Ishaq says that after the battle of Badr, anybody who was pagan converted to Islam. Yet, here we find Usayrim is one of the last pagans. So, Allahu A'lam, the way we reconcile this is to say that after the battle of Badr, any who was pagan in Medina, by and large they converted, but maybe a handful, one or two or three, had remained behind. But there was no community of pagans, and there was no public idol being worshipped. Allah knows best. This is the only way to reconcile. That we now know that Usaidim is still not a Muslim, but he's not a Munafiq. Right? He's not a Yehudi. So this means that there were still a handful of pagans, but perhaps we can interpret Ibn Ishaq's statement as being, as being by the time Badr takes place, there are no idols being worshipped, that idolatry as a system is now gone. And this is the only way to reconcile. There's still a few people left, Usaidim is one of them. So Usaidim is still a, a, a pagan, and on the day of Uhud, he goes and he sees the city completely dead. Because he's not going to fight, he doesn't want to fight with the Muslims. He sees the whole city dead. So he says, where is Sa'd ibn Mu'ad? This was their up and coming leader. And, uh, you know, he is our basically big guy. Where is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh? The woman said, he's at Uhud. So he said, where is so-and-so at Uhud? Where is so-and-so at Uhud? Every one of the people that he used to look up to, they're all at Uhud. So this was when he realized, this is a powerful force. If all of my friends or colleagues or peers or leaders, all of them are fighting at Uhud, surely there must be a reason. And so Usayrim accepted Islam on Saturday morning, the 15th of Shawwal, the morning of Uhud. He accepts Islam right then and there. And he takes his armor and sword and he tells his family who are still pagan apparently at the time, he tells them that if I die, my money will go to the Prophet ﷺ. My money will go to Rasulullah ﷺ. And he walks to Uhud and the Muslims when they see him, they say, Ilayka anna, get away from us, what are you doing here? So they recognize that he's still a pagan. Get away from here, we're not going to let you fight with us. So Usaidim said, I have accepted Islam. And so they allowed him to fight, and he died a shaheed uh, in the, the battle of Uhud. And obviously, the battle of Uhud is taking place early morning, so he accepts Islam after Fajr. Dhuhr time has not yet come in, and so he does not even pray one salah. Right? <laughs> and the Prophet said, he did very little, but his ajr is a lot. And Abu Huraira would test his students by saying, Who is that Muslim who entered Jannah without doing one sajda? Of course, we know the answer, but Abu Huraira would test his students. Who is that Muslim who entered Jannah without making one salah? Right? And, uh, the, you know, the, of course, the answer is Usaidim. Uh, and of course, if somebody says that, how can you say that the one who leaves the salah is not a Muslim, whereas Usaidim did not pray? We say, of course, Usaidim was never required to pray because Dhuhr time never came in, right? Had Dhuhr time come in, he would have prayed. 
So the issue of static salah doesn't apply to Usaidim. Usaidim is not leaving the salah. Usaidim never had the opportunity to pray. He never did one sajda in his life. And yet Allah gave him the uh, shahada. And Allah guides whom He wills. Allah Azza wa chooses to guide whom He wills. He's to, and subhanAllah, how many of us even have heard of non-Muslims who accepted the shahada on their deathbed? How many of us have heard of people that right at the very end, Allah Azza wa knows that they are deserving and they accept Islam right before their uh, death. And the final story, and then inshallah we will conclude. Uh, and I apologize about the length, but I wanted to start with the Prophet That's a whole separate issue of Uhud, what happened with him. The final story uh, that we know is a very small, very quick story, Mukhairiq. Mukhairiq is his name. We don't know much about him at all. All that we know, Mukhairiq, with a qaf, Mukhairiq was of the Jewish tribes of Medina. And Mukhairiq uh, on the day of Uhud told his people, now the Prophet had not approached the Yahud for help in his own wisdom because he knew they're not going to help him. Technically they're supposed to help because that was the treaty, the very beginning, the constitution, that if we are attacked externally, 